Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today's talk is by uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Tahmina Zabin. Uh, she's from University of East uh, Anglia, UK. So the topic is uh, very, very interesting, uh, that explainable AI. She will uh, present uh, with some case studies as well. So we hope that it will be very entertaining uh, and we'll enjoy a lot. As the topic is uh, very difficult, without a doubt, uh, so if we have any query in between, without any hesitation, please uh, uh, write your question in the chat box. And uh, in the midway, uh, Dr. Zabin can uh, answer your questions or at the end, uh, she will take the uh, questions or queries or even uh, any open discussions without any hesitation. So with that, I'd like to request uh, Dr. Tahmina Zabin uh, uh, to start the talk and uh, just uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Please enjoy yourself. Yeah. Uh, let me share my screen then. Yeah, please. So. Okay. So can you see my screen? Uh, it's coming. Okay. Okay, yeah, we can see. So you can just make it full, full screen and then. Yeah. It's there now, isn't yeah, yeah, it? Perfect, yeah, please start, thank you. Okay. So guys, thank you very much for joining this session. Today's lecture will be on explainable AI case studies. So nowadays we are using data-driven decision-making systems in many stages of our life and the machine learning algorithms that we are using to manipulate our data or get information out from our data are mostly black boxes. So the developers probably know how the things are working, but people that are using those automated systems are sometimes struggling on how a specific decision is made. So explainable AI is slightly new topic. Uh, it coined around in 2014-15, where people felt the need to explain whatever the machine learning models are developing in terms of decisions or the predictions that the machine learning models are doing. Explainable AI methodologies are developed to explain or justify what, why a certain decision is made in a certain way. Then we have our algorithms. We can use those use our knowledge of the algorithms or the predictions to improve the methodologies or improve the algorithms that we are building. And so machine learning is a very popular term nowadays. People say that it is on its hype at this moment, but for the next five or 10 years, it is still going to be a quite hot topic because uh, things are going towards automation and data driven decisions are being made. So I've got a chart on, on my right side of the screen from Boston Consulting Group that suggested the broad use of AI in various aspects of our life. Let's say if we are using computer vision on natural language processing, we are doing quite a good lot of handwritten text to digitize text generation using text processing techniques, then there are machine translation. Let's say you are speaking in Bangla, there are things that is being translated into English. Um, probably many other languages can do the same. There are sentiment analysis, so various text analysis techniques are there. And under machine learning, under machine learning, there are recommender systems. Let's say you're buying something on Amazon or eBay, and it is suggesting you re a similar products uh, when, when we are buying based on our user preference and so on. So wherever you are using systems, there is some form of intelligence nowadays to uh, deploy a, a specific set of machine learning techniques and so on. So, we are expecting the use of machine learning and AI to flourish up until next 10 years before it dies down maybe by something else like quantum computing or any other advanced methodological techniques. So today's session will cover a bit on explainable AI. I would like to talk about why it is important nowadays. 
So with explainable AI, we are trying to make the models more interpretable, but there is uh, accuracy versus interpretability trade-offs. I will talk a bit about that. There are tools available for model interpretability. So out of the many tools that are available nowadays, I will talk about one of these specific toolbox called Sharp. Uh, Sharp is developed by Microsoft for uh, uh, we using a game theoric approach of shapely additive explanations. So I will talk a bit about what shapely additive explanations do. Then I planned two or three demo. So I will take you through the code, how we are doing specific things for two or three case studies, depending on how time allows me. So I will try to explain a regression model. Then I will be explaining an image processing model. And finally, I will try to show you one on text analysis model as well. So there is a genomic example I have kept, but it depends on whether you'd like to see it or not. So as you guys heard that I'm from the University of East Anglia, it's from location wise, it's at the northeast of very east of England. And it is one hour drive from Cambridge, about two hour drive from uh, London and it is beautiful countryside. And as you can see from the campus view, it has a lake running by the side of the campus and it, it is situated in a, it, they call it a Norwich, Norwich Research Park and it has various facilities to do genomic research, biological sciences research and very popular computing science department is there as well. So let's move to explainable AI. So it refers to the methods and techniques in the application of artificial intelligence. And it, it came into play so that any solution that AI methods are developing can be understood by humans. And it inspects and try to understand the steps the models are taking in making their decisions. So let's say in a machine learning model, you feed your input data, it gets processed by, a, by an algorithm. Most of the time, these algorithms are black boxes and you produce an output. Most of the times it is a decision or a prediction based on the input data you have. So decision by decision, what I mean, if I say that I have the in information from a loan applicant and the black box model is developed to provide a decision on whether to approve that loan or not to approve that loan. So if the output is a binary decision in this case, let's say yes or no, the algorithm will process the data in a specific way and provide that decision. With explainable AI, what we want is, let's say, uh, the financer decided that a person won't get any loan and the algorithm has to be able to say why the loan was declined. So right now, if I say that why explainable AI is important, there are many points that we can talk about. The first drive for explainable AI is commercial drive. So many enterprises nowadays rely on machine learning models to make important decisions. Let's say I was talking about a loan application. So loan or credit card application are mostly being processed by automated systems nowadays. So these companies, because of the regulatory purposes, they are supposed to be as transparent as possible. So if they're using automated system, then they should be able to explain the decisions that they are making using those models. Then there is a popular drive on stock market prediction or people are doing targeted marketing or advertisement based on the customer base that they have information, previous information they have on, uh, on a specific thing. Then we are using in sensitive scenarios, machine learning models as well. Let's say we are having an automated image processing pipeline that takes an image and trying to identify cancer or benign cells from the image. So we cannot afford to make mistakes on, in those scenarios. There is a technical drive to it as well. So let's say we are talking about, I have developed a model and it performs with 95% accuracy. 
So can we trust our model based on accuracy only? So when we are saying 95% accuracy, it is failing 5% of the time. So we need to understand the edge cases or circumstances that is failing the model at some cases. So knowing the why, that why those specific situations failed, you can learn more about the problem and the data. And knowing that failure scenarios, you can have special measures in place so that you can improve the model afterwards. And there are social and ethical aspects. So if your model that you have trained has any form of biases, it may really harm vulnerable group of people. So let's say somebody in need applied for a loan and the algorithm declined it. So the person was really in need of that loan and it was declined. So we are probably harming a people if the application was not assessed correctly. So we need to be sure that what algorithm we are making and deploying in various practical scenarios are maintaining fairness. So automatic appro approval and rejection of loan applications is one of those cases. And there is a trust issue involved. So you will find people still not that comfortable in terms of, okay, I got my decision through an automated system. So it is easier for humans to trust a business that explains its, its decision. And there are some legal regulations as well that the customer has the right to get an explanation. So if a person is declined of his loan, he has the right to ask why, why I was declined. And when they say that we want to explain the decisions that our models are making, there is a dilemma coming up. So to be more accurate in terms of modeling, what we need is to, we need to combine various checkpoints and we need to build a complex model. As we make the model more complex, you will see that the models are not interpretable and So the complex the model is, the more accurate the models are. And with complexity, we lose the power of interpretability from the model. So you need to choose one from accuracy and interpretability. And from the list of popular algorithms, I hope people in the audience know some of these algorithms. So there are linear models that are very easy to explain because you have X as your input and Y as your output. And output is most of the time proportional to the input. So those models are slightly easier to explain. Then in terms of accuracy, as you go up until ensemble models that probably combine some of the simpler models to give better output, you, you see that the accuracy of the models are increasing if Something is something here is low accuracy and you're going high on the accuracy direction. Uh, you will see that the interpretability is reducing as you are being at more accurate. Neural networks are the current state of the art to solve many of the problems and these models are lacking quite in terms of interpretation in many cases. So the takeaway point from here is we want to be more accurate, but we want to have some form of interpretability to be transparent to the decision makers or the regu regulatory bodies. So the point the explainable AI toolbox developers took is let's try explaining the more complex models because those are accurate. Complex models are though inherently complex. What do we mean by complexity in here, let's say I've got input value and the complex model tried various permutation and combinations before it generated its output value. But whenever I'm processing a certain input, you will see that there is only one decision-making path it is taking at the end of the tunnel. So a single prediction involves only a small piece of complexity of the entire model. So you can try to explain it in a specific way. There are, as I say, there are various toolboxes available. Uh, this corresponding link has multiple of them. And I would like to talk, talk about 
one of them today, so which is a classic Shapely value estimation or SHARP library. So there is local interpretable machine learning interface LIME, then there is DeepLift to explain deep learning algorithms and so on. There is ZEMP uh, that, that is quite popular. But my reason for choosing SHARP is SHARP has included LIME and DeepLift within itself. So one library can be used to explain various set of models that we, we are going to see. So background for Shapely values and SHARP. Uh, the library is developed by Microsoft, as I said, and it is an op open source library. It is implemented to explain machine learning models using the help of Shapely values. The key can contribution of this library is it can explain any free ensemble models using an API called FreeShop. There are deep learning algorithm explanation that you can try to do using an API called DeepShop. And if you do not know what form of algorithm your model is using, so they have a tool set for model agnostic explanation, and the API for that is kernel shop. So this library works with linear algorithms, tree algorithms, deep learning algorithms, and multi-stage combination of any of these. So let's say you have, you have trained a model using a specific amount of data, using a specific set of algorithm. This library has the capability to explain most of the models. So as I say, I will try to talk about the SHARP library. There is a bit of theory involved in it. I hope I don't bore you too much, but shapely values are coming from game theoric approach of modeling. So Lord Shapley won Nobel Prize in 1912, and the concept was brought from mathematics to computing sciences to ex do models explainability. So he was developing Shapley values to make fairness, to ensure fairness in game games. Let's say you, you have multiplayer games and you want to treat each of the participants fairly. So the analogy machine learning explainability toolbox developers took from the game theoric approach is that in a model, if I say I've got multiple features, and if I consider all of my features as different players, they can very well match from the concept that Lord Shapley developed in model explainability. So the game is reproducing in terms of a predictive model, the game concept that Lord Shapley had is ha have an analogous effect of outcome of the model and the players that we are mentioning are the features that are included in the model during its training stage. So Shapley values are based on the idea that outcome of each possible combination of players should be considered to determine the importance of a single player. So in case of Shapely value properties, what it says, let's say I've got multiple features and what I'm trying to do is trying to find out an outcome from a model. And my features in this case, let's say feature one, feature two, feature three, feature four. So the Shapely library suggests that if for a data set, I've got an estimated value of the outcome. So it's an average value. Let's say I've got 500 houses in a database and what I'm trying to predict is the price of a house. So the average price of those 500 houses, let's say it's 22,000 pounds. And I want to estimate a new house's price based on its previous experience or the similar set of houses price using some features, let's say room number, or say uh, it, it, it has a very good school nearby and so on. So there are various features of the property and I want to tell the actual price of the house based on the average value of the houses in that corresponding locality. So it says that the final prediction that I'm getting out from the model is a sum of the base value or the mean value 
and a contribu contribution for each of the features is presented as a linear combination of the sums. So anyways, what it does is it produces, it breaks down your model's decision as a linear combination of things. So you will be able to see that which feature is contributing how much. If the shapely value for a feature is slightly larger than the other, you will consider that that feature was more prominent in the decision making of the things. So if you are using a linear model, such as linear regression, shapely values are basically using a linear pattern. So if you say I've got a base value of 0 0.06 in here and the sharp value for a specific property, if you take it from the diagram, uh, what it does, it takes a linear difference between those two to identify the sh shapely property. So in this diagram that I have on the slide, it is basically a data set called adult data set where you are trying to classify people that aren't more than 50,000 50, pounds and less than 50,000 pounds. For a specific new observation, you will find out the impact value of the shapely value from calculating the specific formula that I have shown in the previous slide. And for any other complex models, such as the gradient boosting regressor, the relationship is no longer linear. It is using a link function. Many of the times the link function, the complex algorithms are using a logistic functions, which are somewhat odd probability or probabilistic information processing. Uh, one of the examples results, I probably tried to explain it in a previous slide. So let's say, uh, the Shapely libraries produce, produces its outputs in terms of a plot called for, force plot. And the base value for a corresponding algorithm, let's say for the 500 houses I was talking about, uh, average house prices in, that, in a specific locality, let's say it's 22,000 something. And for a new house that is getting into the model, let's say that corresponding property has six rooms it has lower status of population of seven point some three something it has an industrial area has an industrial area between 2.1 kilometer of the radius and the nitrate nitrate oxide quality of that corresponding house is lower in terms of the base value of their database it suggested that the property of this new house would be 27.32, which is higher than the average house price of that locality. And the library tried to produce smaller blocks for each of the variables that how much this proper, this variable or how much this feature contributed in the increase of the increase, increment of that corresponding property. So I'll do a demo so that this will probably make a little bit more sense. So what the library is trying to do is it is giving an importance value to all of the features that we are using in the training of the model. So the first example that I would like to share with you today is explaining a regression model and the data set that I'm going to use for this is a simple house pricing model. So that model will predict the selling price of a given house in a Boston area, Boston, Massachusetts area. You can consider that if I have built a model to predict the house price, it, the use case would be that probably a real estate agent is trying to looking for a tool. He's, he's going to use a tool to do his day to day duties. Okay, I've got a new house. What should be the price tag that I put to that corresponding property, whether it is matching with the information of, the, of all of the houses in that corresponding area. So in this data set, it has features such as crime, so per capita crime rate in the town. The more popular ones would be, the relatable ones will be, let's say room, average number of rooms in a building. Then there is a property called age. So if how 
long ago or how, what is the age of this property, how much tax you have to pay for that, for that corresponding property. And there is a pupil teacher ratio by town. So let's say you are buying a property in a specific area and you, that school has less number of teachers. So that might reduce the house's price because it's not placed in a comfort or like useful area where you want to put your child into a good school or so on. And the value that we are predicting from this model is a median value of the owner occupied homes in 1000s. So if you see a value 22.2, it is basically talking in dollars of thousands. So if I can stop my sharing and go back to my demo screen. Okay, can you see my screen here? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, so the first thing we do using a data set is let's say I've loaded the data and in that data, I have all the features that I was showing on the slide. So I've got about 556 properties and for each of the property, I've got the information about the crime ratio, then how far from that corresponding property there is an industrial area. What is the air quality of the property? Let's say nitrate oxide. So if it is close to an industrial area, the air quality might not be good. Age of the property, number of rooms available in this property. So once I have the data set, what we can do is, let's say I was talking about how many observations I have in this data. So I've got 506 observations in here. So first thing what we can do, we can explore the data to see what various features are looking like in my corresponding data set. So I'm using a library called Plotly to pl like plot various variables. So let's say I've created a subplot of all the features I had. So in terms of crime rate or crime, the average value of crime rate you will see is 9.18. There are increased crime rate, crime happening in different properties. So using these diagrams, what you can have a look as what would be the baseline value for or mean value for the houses in that corresponding area. Once you know the mean value, if the value of your new property is falling into the range of probably somewhere else, you would know that the house price won't be the same as the base house price of that area because something is not same. So once you have visualized your data in terms of what's the usual range, then you can do a relationship diagram like this, let's say, in these diagrams, I've got the house price on the y-axis and the value of a specific variable on the x-axis. So using these diagrams, what you can look into is what is the relationship of a specific variable with the house price. So for a crime rate, you will see that the, if the crime rate is increasing, the house price is reducing. And let's say if I look into the room number property, as the room number is increasing, the house price is increasing. So as a human, it is easily understandable to us that it makes sense. The more the room number, the property will be more val valuable. And if there is more crime happening, I probably won't like to buy a property in that region. So the house price will automatically go down. There is another important variable in this, uh, in this data set might be LSS stat. So the lower status of population around that property, you will see that the lower status of population, the value, the higher you have got more people with lower status. So as the lower status of population reduces or increases the relationship, if you have more lower status population, the house price will be lower in terms of value. Our target variable 
in this case is median value of the property in thousands. So if, you, if I look into that corresponding variable, I will see that the minimum house price in this data set is 500, uh, five multiplied by $1,000. The median value is 21.2 thousand pounds. And I'm telling pounds, it's in dollars. And the maximum value of the property or the highest price of the house in this data set is 50,000 pounds. So from the initial data exploration, we can see some information or we can visualize some of the informations that are already available from the data set before doing any form of modeling. So let's say I've got the data, I've looked into the data, I have seen some of the things I want to see that the model has picked as well. So with my help of human eye, I have looked into it and I want the model to find out the same things from the data because it is dealing with the data. So I'm using a categorical boosting regressor in this case. So in case you are, I will try to make the codes available for you afterwards. So the library that you would need for this model is a cut boost library by University of Washington. So what I'm doing using the data right at this moment is I'm splitting the data into 70% and 30% splits. So I will use 70% of the information to train a model and test it using further 30% of it, of the data. I will run the model for 500, 5,000 iterations. And the loss function that I will be using is root mean square error. So every for every house in the data set, there is an exact price and the model will predict the price. If there is a difference between them, the model has some error. So if we say that, that that difference is the error, I will take a root mean square value of that corresponding error. After that, I will fit the model using my training and testing data and evaluate the model using my test set. And I've got multiple parameters under experimentation and I will use the best model in this case. So what the model does once you train it is it after various iterations, what it is trying to do is it is minimizing the root mean square error. So you will see that if at the very beginning, the predicted answer was probably 9,000 pounds away from the actual price, as I am training the model for 5,000 iterations, the difference becomes lower. So it started with 9.5 and the error value reduced up until three point something. So let's say, uh, after 5,000 iterations of the training data, I think the model has learned good amount of things and it is ready to predict the house prices. So we test the model using prediction functions. So I built a model called model regressor. So if I go on top, I named my categorical boosting regressor as a model regressor and I'm using that trained model to give me a prediction on the test set. So when I'm predicting, I'm no longer inputting the output uh, Y test or the actual price. I'm saving the predicted house prices under a variable called Y prediction categorical. So once I have the predicted answer, what I can do, I can compare the actual price, which is saved in Y test and models predicted prices stored in Y predicted categorical. So you can find out the difference that we are having for each of the observations. So I have kept 30% of the data for testing purposes. So I will check all of the test data with the price and the model's predicted price. And if they are doing fairly good job, then I will say, okay, the model is performing quite okay. So I have the model trained. And once the model is trained, what I can do now, I can try to explain what my model is doing. I mentioned that I will be using a library called Sharp that is using the shapely values. It tries to identify the impact value from each of the model. So Sharp uses a JavaScript to visualize the feature importance. So let's say I want to see 
the model has seen uh, like 400 houses as its training data. From the training data, I would like to see what the model has learned. So my model was model regressor. And the model regressor is being explained by the tree explainer. And the tree explainer has found out some values and it's stored it under sharp values. So these sharp values, if I am now plotting a summary plot in terms of a bar diagram, you will see that it has produced a feature importance plot like this. So the feature importance plot, what it is saying is the lower status of population was the most important feature in the house prices increment or decrement. The second important feature this model has found is that room number affects the house price quite high. So on the mean sharp value, you can see there are some values written as 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5 or 3. So what it is suggesting in terms of sharp value is if my house price is 22 point something, base or mean house price in this data set is 22 point something, if the lower status of population is higher, uh, my house price is going to be 3,000 pounds more. For room number, it suggested that the house price will be 2,000 pound or more. And depending on that, you can get an estimate of which of these parameters were, were found to be important by the, by the model. So there is a similar diagram and I have defined a function called waterfall plot in this section. And what it does, it is the same plot as the previous plot. But in this diagram, rather than the sharp values on the x-axis, I've put a composition ratio on the x-axis. So what it is suggesting in this case is, let's say lower status of population has a composition ratio of 40. 40 what it means, out of the 4,000 properties it has seen, 40% of the houses satisfy the criteria that if LSS debt is increasing, house price is increasing. So for room number, it is giving a composition ratio of let's say 23% or something. So for 23% of the houses, the room number, higher the room number, the house price is increasing. So it is trying to give you more insight into what in the training data and what percentage of the training data is helping you make that corresponding decision. You can do some scatter plot like this. So this plot that the library is using in this case is called summary plot. And it is somewhat similar to the bar diagram that we were showing in the previous waterfall plot. In here, what you can see is all the dots represent to individual houses that the model has seen. So if the house has seen 400 houses in the data set, there is a dot for each of the houses in this diagram. And all of the features value are being represented in a color code. So let's say if a feature value is showing color blue, it is basically saying that the value is low. So on the right side, the lower status of population, low means LSS stat has a lower value on the right side. Red is meaning LSS stat has a higher value on the left side. So higher the value of lower stats, so more people with lower status of uh, lo lower status, it is impacting your house price in a negative direction. The less the room number, so for the room number feature, the low value is blue. So lower your room number, it is impacting your house price in a negative direction. So it is quite the toolboxes are quite capable of interrogating your model that. What did it find out from my training data when it is making its decision? And there is another plot that is quite useful is called the dependence plot. The Sharpe's dependence plot is basically capable of identifying interaction between multiple variables. So in the previous diagram, it was showing low value by a color blue and high value by a color red. In here, you can look into the values of that corresponding LSS stat. 
So what that corresponding blue in the previous diagram, you did not know what value of LS stat was blue or what value of LS stat was red. So in dependence plot, you can look into the value of LS stat to identify the types of values we are having in terms of positive impact or negative impact. So let's say uh, in this diagram, the sharp values are on y-axis. In the summary plot, the sharp values were on the x-axis. So you will see that a specific value threshold, let's say LS is that greater, greater than 10, is mostly having negative impact on the house price. So they are saying in this diagram, the model identified, let's say this value is basically my threshold for house price increment or acceptable range of LS stat or less than that. Then there is some outlayers as well. Let's say in these regions, the house price, house prices are higher. And for these values, I have got LS stat value of like less than five or so on. So as, as a property value investigator, what you can do in that case, you can take your predictions from the model and investigate whether the model has dealt with the variables in the way a normal human being would uh, deal with those variables and so on. Uh, there is another diagram that uh, Sharp is capable of producing is called the force plot. So in the force plot, what you can do, you can accommodate all your test data to see that like what's the average house price and what are independent properties house price house prices. Let's say I've got about 100 houses in my test set and now I'm taking a house. Let's say I'm taking this house, which is the 32nd house in my test data set. So in this house, I've got a LS stat value of 2.88 room number 8.034 and based on those I've got, I've got I've got a house price predicted by the model as 44.11 so this house has an, a higher house price than the average house price in this data set so you can identify the houses that has the probability to be higher in price and so on so that would be it in terms of the regression model explanation. Any question? <clears throat> I think no questions. There was a noise only from one side. Okay, anyway, you, okay, you can no continue. problem. Yeah, wonderful. So, so, so the Sharp Library has quite interesting plots that you can use to investigate your model's performance. The next example that I wanted to show, but I'm probably running over time. So I would like to finish within 10 minutes. So this will be a short description of explaining a text analysis model. So the model that I'm going to show with sharp explanation is called ex extremely summarized model. So there is a data set that there is a model that can take a paragraph and produces a one line summary of that corresponding text document using a specific uh, deep learning model to process that corresponding text. So I'm using that extreme summarization data set to show the capacity of the Sharp library to explain uh, what was used it to produce a summary text from from that corresponding report. So let's say a model is trained and, and for the test data, I have provided a long article to the, to the train, a model, trained model, and the model produced an output like this. So this document was on the rugby team playing for the Wales, so they are saying that the players are leaving because we are not paying them enough money. So there was a long document on it and there was some commentary by the chairman of the rugby union. So the model processed this corresponding large amount of text and produced an output text of like this. 
New Wales Rugby Union Chairman Gareth Davis says that 3.3 million players fund should be used to keep the star players in Wales. You will see that the model has done a pretty good job in even summarizing the amount of money that is being discussed in this document. So let's say they were talking about 2 million fund and 1.3 million fund. In the summary model, it has produced a 3.3 million fund, which is a summary extracted from this corresponding document to produce this one line extremely summarized text. So models are capable of producing sensible and well summarized documentation. So what we did in here, we have used a sharp explainer to identify the useful tokens that it has found from this large text. And I have used the sharp plot text function to highlight the values that it is producing. So there is a saliency plot. Let's say I've got multiple sen sentences in that corresponding article. And for each of the sentences, I've got a token created for what are the important, important words in that corresponding sentence. So you can use the sharp library to identify which of these words in these corresponding sentences were most important for this summarization model and so on. So this library is quite capable of dealing with, with natural language processing or the text analysis models. The final group of model that I wanted to show is explaining image processing models. It can be a separate lecture, but for, for now, what I'm doing is quickly showing what sharp deep explainers can do. Let's say I've taken a popular data set of handwritten digits of MNIST data set. I've built a two layer convolutional neural network using the PyTorch library. And after that two layer convolutional neural network, I've got uh, two linear layers to classify my corresponding outputs. So if I've got nine different class, zero to nine, I've got 10 different output classes for any input image gets compared into the 10 different outputs and you sort it out through the algorithm or the neural network to tell the final decision, whatever image you have seen, what number it is. So it is a two layer convolutional neural network and two layer fully connected layer to do the classification and once the model is trained, what I have done is I've used a sharp deep explainer and I've provided as test image uh, three different images. So from index number 100 to 103, I'm displaying the shapely additive output. So I'm displaying the shapely additive outputs for those corresponding test images. So let's say my test images were actually nine, zero, and five. And my model has 10 different channels for zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, up until nine. So when I have my input image as nine, you will see that you will see that the channel for nine is showing more activation. So the red color in shapely values is suggesting higher value and probably blue is meaning less impact and so on. So for nine, the highest activation we received on channel number nine or the channel for nine, but for zero, you will see that there is some activation in zero and there is some activation on channel number six. The reason for this is probably when you're writing a six, you are uh, having the blob of the zero in that corresponding thing. And when you are writing five, you will see that there is activation on channel number five and there is some activation in channel number zero, three or so. It is because like when you're writing three, you probably has the lower loop of a five that is matching with the background data you have used to train that corresponding model. So shapely libraries you can use to explain the intermediate layer activation visualization and so on. Another thing you can very nicely do, uh, it's a genomic data, let's say. So in deep learning models, you many of the times you may find that 
we are using uh, the model that I was showing just before was only four layer neural network. They consist of, let's say, 16 different deep, deep layer. So what you can use using the sharp library is to explain the outputs of an intermediate layer. By intermediate layer, let's say out of the 16 layers in a video graphics group 16 model, if I want to explain the seventh layer, I can even do so. So let's say I've taken a pre-trained model of VGG16. So I'm saying that I have taken a pre-trained model. So it is trained on something else. And I'm feeding some new data to the model and I want to look into the seventh layer of this model to see what was highlighted as the in important area from that corresponding image. And let's say I've got two test images to visualize the seventh intermediate. So let's say I've got a sandpiper with like big beak and so on. So there are two different classes from this corresponding image was activated. But the correct answer is probably it's a sandpiper. For the second image, it's a meerkat, but it probably looks somewhat similar to a mongoose. But it is a layer that is placed before classification. So what it is trying to do is for all of the channels that are available, available for similarity check, it is doing a highlight of the how similar it is to a doe witcher, or it is how similar it looks like in terms of values to a sandpiper. So these tools are very well developed and you can try to use it. Let's say I work in cancer detection with for one of my projects. What we did is what's different in terms of cell type or things that we can do to separate out a normal cell from the cancerous cell and so on. Uh, people has used this library to do genomic sequence analysis as, as well. And let's say right now we talk about COVID-19 with like mutation at three different points. So if you have the normal sequence for a corresponding virus, you can check out for from a new patient whether he's getting the second variant or the third variant with separate mutations at different positions. So these are nucleotides, uh, if you know, from your biology knowledge, probably adenosine, guanine, thiamine, and so on. So wherever the mutation happens, you probably can see from some of the diagrams that the shape library is capable of using. I mentioned about the deep lift library in my list of explainable AI toolbox. So these guys are using a visualized sequence from the deep lift library to plot the genes and what we are using after that, we are using sharp explainers and deep TensorFlow to visualize the changes or the variations that are being used in there. So I would like to stop now. So the library is somewhat capable of dealing with a large variety of data. So depending on your applications, or use case, you can use it to make your mod models more explainable. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My kids are <laughs> fighting, so <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, thank you for your nice presentation and uh, with some uh, tutorials as well, uh, though it's too short considering one hour or less than an hour, um, but uh, you have presented it very nicely. So I welcome uh, for questions. Audience, if you have any questions or comments on anything, please uh, kindly raise your voice. Yeah. We have a hands up from Freeman. Okay, okay, Simon, unmute. Okay, I unmute. Okay, please. Uh, so I'm Simon Bidhanbari from University of Dhaka. A question I would like to uh, ask to the speaker. And the, um, you explain the importance of shapely value and the relation with uh, um, models. Uh, I, I could not understand it properly. Please, can you explain it a little bit, little bit more about the uh, importance of uh, theory of shapely values and 
the relation uh, with the visualizations. Okay. So shapely values are a value impact value assigned to each of the variables. Let's say if you're seeing a shapely value of three for a, oh, do you want me to share my screen maybe? So shapely values are basically impact values for a feature based on the database training data database the model has seen. Where did my share screen go? Maybe at the top or bottom? Okay. Anna, yeah. I have got things on the slide, so I can't okay, probably okay. use this. All right. Yeah, now it's okay. So feature importance plots and summary plots are things that you see on the Sharp library. And on the x-axis on this diagram, there are some impact values that are presented as mean sharp value. So let's say I've got 400 houses in my training data set. For each of the houses, the model has been trained and it tried to minimize the predicted value and the actual value. If there is a difference between the predicted value and the actual value, the model is probably not doing a good enough job, but the model is trained for 5,000 5, iterations. So it has tried to minimize that error as much as it could. You will see, let's say, oh, let's say for this corresponding house with an LSS that value of, let's say 17 or 18, the house price was impacted by 12.5 than its base value. So if the average house price in, in this data set is 22.2, this house's price was 12.5 thousand pounds more. For another house in the data set, let's say for this LS stat ratio was slightly lower and the house price was increased by 10,000 pounds. So based on all the data the model has seen, it has created an average impact value or the mean sharp value for that corresponding variable. So it has seen 400 houses, 400 houses and 400 houses, different houses has different value impact. But on an average, if you get a value for mean sharp value, this corresponding feature is showing that it is at least increasing 3000 pounds for all of the houses on the right side. So in terms of positive impact, we are having an average value using the shapely impact value library and creating a global feature importance plot. So this summary plot in this case is a local feature importance plot where you have got all your observations shown separately. In the global feature importance plot, you are averaging all of your findings and giving an average value to it to explain the importance of, the, of that corresponding variable. Does that un, un, explain it a little bit more? Yes, yes. Thank you for your uh, good explanation. Uh, I think I understood it better now. Uh, thank so you. There, for there, there is a documentation available on this toolbox. So I learned the explanation while I was using it. So if you start exploring it in terms of like your data set or an example, the hands-on experience gives you more, more better understanding, I would say. Any other question? Thank you very much. Abdullah has his- Yeah, yes, phrase. thank you. So I unmute him. Abdullah Al-Sajid, please ask your question. Oh, he, he, he left out. Okay, in at the moment, okay. Sajid, are you here? There is another hand. Okay, okay, so Abdul Awal, please ask your question. Uh, thank you, madam, for the nice presentation. Uh, I am using SHAP uh, for different purposes, but currently I am facing problems for the multi-class classification problems. Uh, there are lots of bars are coming in the multi-class problems and uh, it's very hard for me to explain the things. Could you please uh, kindly help me 
something uh, like that. I How can, I can, get... I can try. Yeah. So yeah, I guess in my slides, let me go back to the slides again. Uh, but this is multi-class problem. Not uh, I'm problem. talking about yes. it. Yes. So for, for a multi-class scenario, let's say you have got uh, five different classes. The way various models work is a multi-class, multi-class, quickly. This is a multi-class problem, isn't it? So I've got 10 different classes for 10 different digits. So for the multi-class classification, you will have shapely values for each of the channels. So if you have, let's say, one of the classes, second class, third class, in that case, you will have impact value for each of the classes separately. And you will see that you have to use an index around the sharp values in here, let's say sharp values one, zero, two, three, depending on your number of classes. So when the shapely plots are being generated, what it is basically doing is maybe it is whichever channel that you are choosing. So you've got, let's say you've got five different channels. Whichever channel you are choosing based on the index value you are having, it is considered as the positive case and rest of the classes are considered as negative case. So it has multiple bars for each of the classes. It has different shapely values and different shapely values when you are considering the shapely values for a channel, rest of the observations are considered as the negative class. So let's say I've got a force plot in here and you will see that the, if the model is outputting the value as a probabilistic value, let's say out of the five classes, it say the probability of this sample falling under class one is 70%. Uh, Second class, it has an association of 10% uh, and second for the third class, it has an association of 2% or so. So the final prediction is being selected on the highest probability of the multiple classes. So whichever probability value for a specific channel is highest, the model is outputting that, okay, I think your uh, sample is falling under this class, but it has some, some probabilistic association to two other classes. So it in the shapely force plots, you will see that it will try to explain what reduced your probability for that corresponding class based on the probability loss that you had on the two other classes. So the way to treat it, it will be in terms of binary and whichever class you are highlighting, it should be positive case rest of the classes would be considered as the negative case for shapely values. So, so the first thing you need to have shapely index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 for each of your channel, whichever plot you are trying to display, that would be your positive case. And other classes of that corresponding plot would mean that impact value would be, would be negative for the other classes on those corresponding diagrams. What are your classes, by the way? What, what type of data that you are trying to process? Is he here? Thank you, madam. Uh, I understand uh, the topics. So you have to use the indexes to select the classes that you are considering as a positive. So if you have five classes, you have to create five different diagrams with one of the classes as positive and rest as the negative for interpretation. So you have to create, if you have five classes, you have to uh, create five, fe five feature importance plots with one of the classes on the positive side and rest of the classes on the negative. Okay, yes, thank you. So uh, we can move to the next question from Abdullah Al-Sajid, uh, please. Assalamu alaikum everyone. 
My name is Abdullah Sajid. I'm studying first year in Tripoli, University of Dhaka. Your question, please. Probably he is out again because it's happening for him. Yeah, he is out. Oh, so sorry. Okay, any other questions from anyone else? Or comments on overall, not praise, but any other points there? Yeah. Anyway, so maybe. I'm sorry, I got disconnected. Uh, okay, okay, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, please. Sorry. So thank you for amazing talk. So recently in doing literature review for related research project, I came across a concept in explainability called fair washing. So yeah. I, I, tell him to write the question on the chat. I will try yeah, to answer yeah. later. Maybe uh, he's out. So when he will come back, I'll ask him. So if, if any other questions, please. Uh... Uh, sorry, I'm okay, extremely okay. sorry. I think there okay, are if some you dis problems. get disconnected. So on that time, you just uh, can you, next can time. you type on the chat, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, next sure. Time. sure. Now, now yeah, you continue sorry. to talk. Yeah. Okay. So I came across the concept of fair watching. So could you explain it from your perspective? So could you explain from your perspective how it hinders explainability? And from my understanding, it can be used to bypass audits and make biased black boxes seem like they are fair. Fair. Uh, so how can they be, how can recent developments in explainability help mitigate that? So, so as you are saying that they are trying to bypass the regulatory boards by, so, Anything that appears or gets a report in, in, in the literature review that they are trying to bypass it, the regulatory bodies have a knowledge of those kind of platforms. And any explainable AI library is aware of these cheating ways or like faking the fa fairness options. So I, I guess people are aware of these, these type types of tricks and there are ways to detect any variation that does not look like genuine genuine by various various interfaces so i think people are aware of the toolboxes that that is capable of like breaching the genuine genuine way of presenting things so the toolboxes are advanced enough and interestingly the most of the giant tech providers have invested their energy in developing toolboxes to be as transparent as possible so those will be caught we can we can catch those corresponding uh, breaches quite easily i i would say you catch a hakoro So, Does uh, that answer your question a bit? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. That answers okay, my question. Okay, questions. wonderful. So I guess we don't have any more questions because nobody raised hand. Or, it's fine. Uh, we are yeah. over 10 minutes. And no, no, it's okay. Time is not a problem uh, during discussion. Uh, we have a good amount of uh, professors or PhD holders uh, from Bangladesh and one from Australia, one from India. And uh, I don't know some others maybe from other places, but uh, if anyone has any uh, comment, uh, not comment, I mean questions or queries, uh, or to add something on this topic, so please uh, raise. Uh, Dr. Nasima is here as well. So anyway, so I guess no more. Anyone else? Okay, we. I saw. Okay, uh, Dr. Fida, please. Um, hey, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, well, so I basically don't have any questions, but uh, I'd like to know more about the application side. Uh, so I understand like there, there are some very specific uh, you know, the application area, uh, but uh, uh, grossly like uh, why people will run for uh, explainable AI? The toolboxes are mainly there to 
support the use of machine learning in a fair or explainable manner. So the algorithms are here for probably 20 years and so on. But as we are making automated decisions nowadays, mm -hmm. what we want it to associate with the explanations of how that corresponding decision were, were, were made. So let's mm -hmm. say I did two or three consultancy projects where like the industrial partners, they have deployed models. What we try to do using the help of so, the explainable AI toolboxes is- Wonderful. So- Provide yeah. explanations so, to the predictions that are being made. Yeah. Fine. Yes. So who are actually the industry? Like what kind of industry were there? Like- so so let's say oh, your project yeah yeah but yeah I'll so just... one of one of them were trying to do from the blood samples they were trying to find out okay, healthy so and unhealthy medical side so, okay yeah yeah so okay. what they wanted to show that when something is detected as unhealthy what are the parameters that contributed to that corresponding unhealthy so whatever okay. feature mm -hmm. were used to train the model what are the variables that contributed a specific sample to be labeled as unhealthy? So if something did not look right to an expert, they would be mm -hmm. directly able to pick out that this variable does not look right or right. Yeah. In that. Yes. Yeah, I understand. That's a very good talk. And uh, yeah, so that has, I think, good prospect. Yeah, so probably we can have some talk later. Maybe uh, I can connect you over some other places, maybe LinkedIn or something, that it, okay. if, if this is okay. Yeah, thank you very much. My personal research area mostly is AI for healthcare, so. Okay, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. That'd be fine, yeah, sure, thank you. All right, I guess we don't have any questions. So uh, one uh, type that is there any uh, very useful material uh, in YouTube to learn because YouTube has, or the the, the wave has so many materials which one to start with uh, uh, maybe I, at this I moment it's very difficult yeah to share right i i suggest explainable ai does not have very many good talks online as well so what i learned from is the toolbox developer is called mark sandberg he has two or three talks available and the library that i am using has a very good documentation with examples for various use cases. So it helped me in terms of learning. Uh, so uh, there, there will probably be quite a quite good few Coursera or Udemy courses that, that cover material a bit. So not probably any, any specific YouTube channel yet, but if you search with the name of the library, people are using it quite a lot nowadays and the documentation is quite rich, I would say. The best uh, best way they... to start. Yeah, please, please. Best way to best way to start is to put your hands on a data set or a model, and then use the steps from some example step by step, and try to gain understanding of what is being displayed to you, whether it is making sense in terms of the data that you are uh, using to do the modeling. And so, yes, please. Yeah, so thank you. So I, I have just one uh, point to raise that, uh, I mean, explainable AI is uh, uh, very much still unexplainable to the community. And I try to get uh, speakers, um, as we have seen the, through Facebook and other channels, but I didn't get enough. Uh, so um, uh, it means that, I mean, there are not so many uh, um, experts at the moment. People are using exploring uh, to explain it as much as possible. Uh, so my question is that, uh, based on your experience, that uh, should young researchers go into this uh, domain without having profound uh, mathematics, because uh, it requires uh, very rigorous mathematics uh, to understand and to produce some models and uh, implement in some things. Yes, using some tools like this one uh, will be relatively easier, but uh, overall, so would you please just give some comments on that. Thank you. So research area wise, if you have mathematical understanding, it definitely helps you in understanding the algorithms, the background workings of things. And I recommend people to invest a bit of time in understanding things. Just because the black box concept of machine learning came into light just because 
there are toolboxes, very easy to use toolboxes. So you can take the data and fit it to any algorithm that you name and probably get some output. But to even to model, create a fair and probably robust and generalized model, you need to have the understanding of the parameters and so on. So for young researchers, the, this generation is a uh, heaven to live in just because there are a lot of open source material that you can get access to. There is nothing that is not available, available on internet nowadays. So if you commit to learn things by yourself, things that are not available right at your hand, but if you look for it, there is definitely some good material out there. So I would encourage people to explore and you have to be ready to invest a bit of time whenever you are struggling, either by approaching people you know that are working in that area or looking for talks on YouTube or any other knowledge platform. There are quite very good blogs in machine learning mastery or medium or towards data science. So there is, I would say that it's not that difficult to go for. If you have the interest to go and learn, learn things, Okay, uh, so uh, there is another question. Uh, if you just look at the Facebook, uh, not not the Facebook chat box. Uh, this is about can this library be used uh, for explaining the model of segmentation packs, for example, crack segmentation? If possible, how this concept can be applied? So it's from Al -Mans Masrur Khan. Al Masrur. So are you using a library called Mascar CNN or something? If no, no I'm, I'm just using UNET for segmenting the cracks. So the you have place. encoder and decoder to yeah, yeah. separate out the segmentation. Yeah, I have encoder and decoder. You, you, you can use it. If you are using a standard library such as TensorFlow or PyTorch, you can. So you yeah. can see the different outputs at different layers of encoder to investigate it. Yes, it is possible. Uh, OK, thank you. Thank you for this. So, so on, the, on the website for SHARP, if I can put up a link on the chat box, there are image, quite a few image examples that you can look into. And they have like an, some examples prepared for inter, intermediate layer visualization. So if your unit has the encoding layers and you have the outputs from the encoding layers, you can add gradient explainer on those layers to get the visualizations of the, those intermediate layers. Ah, okay, I understand, thank you. All right, I guess uh, we have no further questions. Last one, anyone? No. <laughs> anyway, so uh, uh, with that, we'd like to wrap it up and uh, special thanks to uh, Dahmina Zabin uh, for her time and uh, preparation for uh, this presentation. I requested her to make it uh, very uh, simple because this is the first uh, time for me to arrange something on explainable AI. Uh, yes, earlier, another professor from University of Michigan. Nicola did. Nicola, yeah, Nicola did. did one. But that was a bit uh, um, uh, more complex side, <laughs> so uh, that's why his applications, his applications are more sophisticated, such as yeah, automated yeah, yeah. driving and so, so on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my my plan is to arrange uh, a, a few more lectures uh, on these uh, explainable AI issues because uh, I find that especially among my channels, not so many uh, people. It's are disturbing, so I must uh, uh, thank and close it today. And if you have any questions uh, in the event page uh, in the Facebook, you can uh, raise post it. them. I'll try to address them later. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And also, uh, Zabin will share her, I mean, uh, examples. Slides uh, and the codes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you will share to me as well. So if someone emails me so that I can forward, or you can email yep. to her directly, just Google and get the information. Uh, nowadays, it's so easy. With that, uh, I thank you all. Uh, I mean, a good, uh, knowledgeable participations from here. Uh, so I'll try to uh, arrange more. And if you have any speakers, or if anyone uh, is willing to volunteer a bit uh, 
uh, I mean, related issues, uh, feel free to talk to me and then uh, we can arrange this. Uh, we need to explore this area. Uh, in fact, one of my students, uh, he just uh, in private chat box, he told me that I need to uh, start working in this domain. <laughs> so, so it means that, I mean, uh, before I do, I need to learn how to do. So please uh, teach me just like Dr. Jamin did. So with that, uh, we uh, conclude here. Thank you so much. Someone will uh, ask, uh, and actually I got some private message regarding how to get the YouTube video. Uh, I'll share to the YouTube video, uh, YouTube and then uh, later on in Facebook. So you can also find it. If you don't find it within a uh, couple of days, then just knock me in person. With that, thank you so much and hope that you will attend in future uh, talks and others. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you guys yeah. for attending. Yeah, Bye. Sorry. I stop uh, the stop, stop pause recording.